Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here with you today to share with you my enjoyment of the art of origami. This is a long-standing tradition in Japan, the art of folding paper that has spread to enthusiasts around the world. I will talk to you a bit about the history and background of traditional origami, and I will also talk a bit about some of its modern manifestations. Paper from plant fibers was invented in China around two, in the second century, and the art of paper making was first exported from China to Korea and Japan around 610 AD. Origami dates back roughly to the same time. For a long time, there was a focus on designs passed down by word of mouth. Today, there are also artists whose work builds on this tradition who produce quite unique and lovely work. Possibly the most famous of the traditional designs is the origami crane, an elegant bird with four points. It has a point at the tail, a point at the beak, and two wings, and it develops a three-dimensional form out of two-dimensional paper. The process of folding a crane makes use of a couple of special shapes called bases. Uh, we start with a flat piece of paper, do some creasing, and produce the square base here, which has is a, a folded down square version of the large piece of paper. I might mention that the square base is actually an inside out water balloon base. If you take the same paper with the same folds, but push in the middle and fold it up so that the white is showing, it will be a water balloon base. From the square base, we can develop a number of figures, but one of those is the bird base, which we get by folding these edges inside. And the bird base is a very, very useful base for creating all kinds of animals. You'll find it frequently used in books on origami patterns. To make the bird, we fold up the two wings, and then we fold in edges to make two long skinny bits and we fold up the long skinny bits to make the head and the tail. So now we have a flat version of the bird and all that remains to do is to pull on the wings and create a three-dimensional form of the crane. So flat and three-dimensional. Many people became acquainted with the crane through the story of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. This is based on the story of a real girl who acquired leukemia from the bombing of Hiroshima. And she knew the tradition that if you could fold a thousand paper cranes, you could get a wish or some good luck. And she thought maybe if she folded a thousand paper cranes, she might get well. Some other traditional forms you may have run into include a simple box made from two pieces of square paper, one for the lid and one for the bottom. And the shape of that can be varied as well. Or the origami fortune teller. A lot of us played with that in school. You fold it up and then you can put your put four fingers in, three fingers and a thumb, and you can switch it back and forth and then saying things like letters and numbers. And then finally you tell someone's fortune by pulling up a flap to see what's underneath. Other traditional forms are very simple as well. Here's a simple origami heart. Here's a, here's a fish. In case you didn't figure out it was a fish, they added a few cues here in the illustration. Some of the forms of origami are made to play with children and can be quite dynamic. There's a jumping frog that you can put on the table and make jump, and a fox puppet, especially when you highlight it with a little bit of decoration. Elegant traditional designs include the lotus, samurai helmet, and of course many animals like this cute little mouse, or whale, or puppy. And here someone has made sure you know it's a puppy by adding some little bits of ink to delineate the nose, the tongue, and the eyes. Flowers are another popular thing to do with a piece of paper. This is a tra very traditional iris design and a traditional tulip design here with a stem added. Using origami type folding to wrap paper, wrap packages, is another strong tradition. And here is an example done by Clementa Giusto, where the paper is folded up and inserted into little pockets to hold the package closed. 
and produce a design. So how to wrap a package elegantly without any kind of ribbon or tape. A simpler version is this pinwheel folding that wraps up a square object like a CD or a DVD or a card. And you may have encountered some origami based packaging such as this wine package that allows you to squash the last of the wine out of the box. A well-known contemporary artist from Japan is Tomoko Fuse, and probably she's most widely known for her elegant little box designs made from four pieces of paper for the top and four for the bottom. I really enjoy playing with those in all different kinds of paper. I cut up squares from wrapping paper and find combinations that I enjoy to make her boxes. The inside of the box is also interesting. It has four little squares on the lid and triangles on the base. And with the same folding for each of the four pieces of paper, you can produce a zigzag or lightning design, just triangles or a pinwheel design. So quite a variety of things you can do with your simple technique. There are triangular versions of this box as well and many other variations that she's devised that produce interesting designs on the lid of the box. You can look for her books. She has amazing origami boxes, joyful origami boxes, and other ones. And here is one on spiral boxes. And it creates a very three-dimensional spiral on top of the box, on top of an octagonal box. Can you imagine receiving a gift in one of these boxes? Quite special. She also has done some major work. This is from an installation and exhibition video. And these are designs made from large pieces of paper folded many times to produce a flexible structure that you can then arrange in different ways. Uh, I recommend if you just Google Tomoku Fuse and video, you should find this particular design uh, video that you can take a look at how that actually was done. I myself much enjoy the geometric and modular origami. And this is an example of how we can fold a, a simple unit of, from a piece of paper. And then if we make six of them, we can put them together to make a beautiful cube. If we make 12, we can produce a stellated octahedron. And if we make 30, we can make a stellated icosahedron. And this, especially this latter unit, is very reminiscent of the Kusudama ball origami, where you may bring out floral aspects to the design or very geometric and colorful, or even in this case, some swirls. One of the leading individuals in the development of patterns for Kusudama origami is Ekaterina Lukasheva. Another Japanese artist of considerable renown is Akira Yoshizawa. He developed some of the techniques for explaining and teaching origami that we use today. And he also developed a technique called wet folding, where you fold with wet paper so that you can form very, very structural and detailed looking designs, especially good for animals. You can't do this with ordinary origami paper because ordinary origami paper isn't tough enough to do this with. You need to use some origami paper that is uh, designed to withstand being folded while wet. Um, but it's a, it's a beautiful technique. And here is a book um, uh, showing another of his works. In this country, um, Massachusetts artist Michael LaFosse has continued the tradition of wet folding. He really likes to do animals and plants that represent the nature of various places. I know he did an exhibit for the Arizona Desert Museum. And he makes his own paper so that he can control the texture and strength and appearance of the paper when he folds it. He also is very fond of butterflies and has several books and videos out on making butterflies. Um, and here you can see some variety of shapes and colors that he's created from four butterflies and a few more here above. And then of course, butterflies can also be quite traditional and simple like these 
four down here at the bottom that I enjoy folding. Another imaginative and prolific author, author of origami books is John Montrell. I have this book of origami inside out, which is quite fun and intriguing because what he, what he does in this book is to find ways to bring the white side of the paper and the colored side of the paper together to make a design such as a chessboard or a penguin with both the black or colored and white sides showing. I did say prolific, right? That's just a subset of his books. But he's also done some bigger works. This is one of his dinosaurs yeah, all done, not quite life-size, but certainly large in a garden. Another extremely well-known origami artist is Robert Lang. He's an engineer by profession and turned his skills to figuring out ways to use mathematics and the computer to design very, very complicated creatures. He likes to make insects, for example, which have many, many things sticking out, legs and antennae and such. And so he was able to tell, use a computer to help figure out how to fold the paper to produce designs like this praying mantis from a single piece of paper. I got very excited when I found this design years ago, the hyperbolic paraboloid. It's, it's a beautiful curved shape that you create just by folding back and forth parallel to the edge of the paper. Um, and it just naturally folds itself up into this shape after you do that. And Eric Demain, who devised that design, has carried it on to considerably farther with these elaborate um, accordion folded art, bits of art. And here he added a bit of frivolity with some origami frogs to this piece. Another origami artist who enjoys performance aspects of origami, and he also rides a unicycle around um, and juggles, is Jeremy Schaefer. And one of his original designs is a flasher, where you fold the paper up into a very tight knot, and then when you shake it out, it expands in a dramatic moment. You can see his work and his instruction videos on YouTube. He's uh, very has quite a bit of things available on YouTube. Well, my serious interest in origami was kindled again in the 90s when I came across the whole field of origami tessellations, taking a large sheet of paper and finding ways to fold it down to make an extended pattern. It could be part of an infinite pattern, um, just working with the little folds in the paper. So making it from large flat piece to a small flat piece with an elaborate design. Here's, a, here's one that's very dimensional and very curvy by Ilan Garibi. Um, you can see that the paper is compressed into multiple folds here, producing this wonderful curve and these nested shapes. There's another one, this one by Ekaterina Lukasheva, the same one who was doing the Kusudama balls. And she has these crisp little cubes and then these wonderful little spirals in between them. And here's one that was done with spirals and triangles. Very, very elegant design. With the tessellation techniques of folding over and over and over again parallel to the edges, you can develop uh, folded pieces that can then be pulled out to make shapes. And so Goran Konjavad has been doing quite a bit with that kind of technique you can see here that he has a folded pattern that allows you to pull out this design or here to make more of a um, convex shape and here to make more of a butterfly shape. Another artist who has done some tessellations is Joel Cooper. Here's a very elaborate kind of organic folding. And he also uses some of that idea in developing masks or faces. Uh, here's a couple more and he does some elaborate treatment with paint on the surface of the paper before folding it to get this sense of metallic structure or color that goes with some of his faces. Paul Jackson's another well-known figure in the field of origami and here is one of his pieces created from just some overlapping folds teased into a pleasing overall shape. 
He is a proponent of the art of single fold origami, where you score a piece of paper and allow it to fold with that score to produce a very interesting shape with just one fold. Quite a challenge. Here's a more elaborate kind of project he did. He has some hands, the two back sides of hands, two front sides of hands, and he has created these large pieces um, by some elaborate folding. And here's the back side of one of his pieces in, that was shown in the previous slide. He also has done developed pleat folding, where you take paper with maybe some writing on it or some illustrations on it, and you fold it so that what you see is just the edge of the fold, and you can create new designs by the way that you fold the paper and what you allow to show along those edges. Sort of a little bit related to quill work, where what makes the design is the edge of paper that's been curled up. I've played around myself a little bit with some of the variations on standard shapes. Here is a box, standard simple box, but what I did was I folded the edge over and then I did a blintz fold, which means folding the corners into the middle, and then I treated that as though it was one piece of paper to make the lid, and it produced a lid with the design of a ribbon and a bow on built into the folded lid. A very close relative of that is this box which has a place inside where you can hide a picture or a message or a greeting inside the lid of the box. The more serious work um, is two-dimensional. I fold a number of small units that were inspired by the tessellation technique, but I can fold each unit separately and I can combine all kinds of different papers in making these works. And this early study from 1996, I wanted to see if I could take this pink square folding on floating on top and make it disappear behind and take the um, blue and white material and have it trade places with the pink material through some natural progression. And this is reminiscent, in my eye at least, of the Escher works where he goes from a fish to a bird, for example. Hence the title, Shades of Escher. Another progression that I explored was trying to understand how a person's mind might behave as they gradually lose their ability to remember things. And so here in the beginning, we have no memory lapses. This is someone who remembers everything and all the thoughts are very coherent. They all connect with each other. Um, there's no gaps. And then here's a symbol. I forgot something. I forgot a name. I forgot a number. I forgot I was supposed to be somewhere. But A, it's still all connected. It's still making sense. It's still the same person that you have always known. But then somewhere along in here, even with this very gradual progression that doesn't change, it's just a little bit more each time, there's a kind of sudden change from a continuous pattern to a broken up pattern you lose that coherence. And so this illustrates how something that happens gradually can seem to happen very suddenly. After I played around with those simple square units for a long time, I devised a way of folding a slightly bigger piece of paper off center, which gave me a whole lot more angles that I could use. And this piece here was done with translucent paper so that you can kind of see how the layers go. So this little Square here is one piece of paper extending out to here and down to here and over here and up to there. And then the channel in this piece of paper fits with the channel in this piece of paper here. And then we keep on going. And so we can connect them all through their channels. And then um, we can get the overall design. And by folding this asymmetrically, I get many more angles that I can produce and I can get the sense of a circle this little pointed star figure. And I was intrigued by the curves that appear when you fold things with straight lines. And this cyclone galaxy from 1999 is one that brings out the curves in a work that is really only consists of straight line segments. 
a slightly more recent piece here is filaments and voids. Um, I was commissioned to do a work on um, the structure, the large scale structure of the universe. And that is a structure of filaments and voids. And um, so I did, this is one version I did of that. The filaments are where the material, where the galaxies are, and the voids are relatively empty spaces between the filaments. And then you may have noticed what's behind me, which is a picture of a comet. This is a piece called A Comet Has Two Tails. It consists of wrapping paper and then some translucent paper added in to emphasize the design. So I thank you for joining me today and would like to recommend a few resources. Uh, Origami USA has uh, information, patterns, supplies, opportunity to meet other origami folks at meetings, virtual at the moment, but real in other times. They have a magazine called The Fold. And then there's a movie, a film that came out a few years ago, Between the Folds from 2008, and it features many of the artists that I've mentioned in this. Also, some of us have been organizing an origami club of Central Iowa. We currently are on Facebook, and we will use online media for meetings for the rest of this academic year. And we hope to have in-person meetings uh, as soon as the COVID situation allows. This is a collaboration between the Octagon Center for the Arts in Ames and the Creative Artist Studios of Ames. And the Octagon already has a collection of origami books and paper supplies in its reading area for people who wish to experiment with some designs. So I'm Leanne Wilson, university professor, retired from physics and astronomy and member and co-founder of Creative Artist Studios of Ames and a person who really, really enjoys origami. Thank you for joining me today. Today, I would like to show you how to make a trillium flower out of a bird vase. I started with a piece of paper with a concentric target-like design because that will make all the petals the same. And the first thing I did with this was to create a square base. This is the square base. And the way you make a square base is that you start by folding the paper in half in a book fold, like a book. You fold it the other way in a book fold turn it over and you fold it on the diagonal with the white side showing and do it again. And then when you push the middle up and squeeze the edges together, you get the square base. The square base has folded edges that reach from the center and it has open edges on the other end. Next thing we're gonna do is to take the open edges and fold them to the middle. So this is folding the open edge to the middle. And then we're gonna take that and we're gonna push it inside, like what you see on the inside. So it starts as a flap and it ends up on the inside. And I've done that on all four places. I have the bird base. And the bird base is something that you can look up. You can Google bird base. You can get lots of videos and instructions for making the bird base. It's a popular base for making all kinds of things, including the famous crane. Today, I'm gonna to use it to make a flower. This flower design is something I came up with myself a few years ago, and I rather enjoyed the way it came out. So I'm folding these big pointed flaps up. I pointed, folded two of them up. I need to fold all four up, but what happened to the other ones? Ah, okay, I have to open it. And then I can fold the other ones. So, so now I have a little triangle and I want to decrease this angle from 180 degrees. I want to shorten this long side. So I'm gonna fold this part up and I'm gonna fold it so that this edge here is parallel to this edge. And this fold is perpendicular to this edge. I'm gonna do the same thing over here. Over and do it on the other side. It's 
So now I have these things turned up on both sides. Now I'm gonna fold them to the inside, push them to the inside to make them kind of zigzag. See how that became a zigzag. I'm gonna do that on all four places. And here as well. Doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Real flowers are never not always absolutely perfect either, but it needs to be pretty close or it won't work. Okay, so here's the last one. You can see now I have one to pop out. I have little zigzag folds between these four petals. Got two of these out. Good, it's like the start of a flower. Take the third one up, and ah, I can only put three up. The fourth one's going to have to be the stem. So that's our trillium flower. And sometimes what I like to do with it is I like to curl the petals because I think it makes it a little more flower like, a little more delicate and elegant. And then you can put a wire down the stem, and you can put a bunch of these in a vase, and you can have a nice bouquet of flowers that won't fade or wilt or die, but that will decorate your house for as long as you want them to. All right, thank you very much. That's my trillium flower.